Thanks, Rachel. And uh, I, again, I'd really like to, to acknowledge and thank the last panel. Um, when, when, we put this, uh, when we put this symposium together and when we, when we thought about bringing four or five solution providers onto stage at once and, and to have them each make presentations, uh, we set out some ground rules. We said, uh, please make the, the presentations content rich, provide case studies if you can, but you know, you're always suspicious. You know, are we going to get uh, uh, shameless marketing instead? Uh, but I would say the, uh, the group did a fantastic job of, of really presenting a lot of content. Uh, it's clear that, that this industry is still very engineering oriented, lots of charts and graphs. Uh, and, and I think a lot of substance in terms of, of really good examples of, of real-world case studies. I think we're going to take that, uh, if, if possible, even further here. We have uh, two speakers uh, on our final panel here this afternoon uh, that uh, very much come from the, the customer and engineering side of the equation. Uh, we're pleased to be joined by uh, Harry Hobbs. Harry uh, is in charge of... Uh, uh, facilities. Uh, I'd like to tell us how broadly, geographically, uh, with uh, the Intercontinental uh, Hotel chain, and is doing some very interesting uh, pioneering work in San Francisco and beyond uh, with energy storage systems. Uh, Harry spoke a year ago when we did a similar uh, uh, conference on customer side energy storage. It was a very interesting case study then. I think it's going to be even more interesting now because it's had another year to run. Uh, so, uh, additional uh, uh, time over target, and I know they're looking at expanding uh, what they're doing. Uh, to, to Harry's left is uh, Tom McCalmont. Uh, Tom runs McCalmont Engineering, uh, and uh, Tom and his the company are involved in engineering storage solutions and worked, I know, with a number of you in the room. Uh, and Tom's going to talk about two or three case studies. Uh, that, uh, that his company has been involved with uh, designing and implementing. So we're going to be able to get into some really good tactics here, I think. Uh, we'll have each of them present, and then we'll, uh, we'll take some questions uh, from the audience. So with that, Eric. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, thank you all for sticking around to, to see what we have to say. Um, all right, Dan. Um, as Don says, I, I work for Intercontinental Hotels uh, and predominantly in the Bay Area. Um, I have six hotels that I am somewhat directly responsible for and two that are um, sort of our, our, our pilot uh, projects, if you will. Um, the Tall Blue Hotel is a 33-story high-rise in downtown San Francisco right next to Moscone. Center and the hotel at the, the other side of it, built in 1928, is the uh, world-renowned uh, Mark Hopkins Hotel. And I, I'm an advocate for these technologies in all types of uh, building situations. I don't think old is any excuse for, for not, uh, you know, bringing buildings to current technology. As a matter of fact, I'm often struck by, you know, statistics from uh, LEED that, that suggest that if um, if, if we rely exclusively on new construction to fix climate change, we'll, we'll really never get there. 99% of the problem out there is in the built environment. So what we have to do is foster technologies that will retrofit us back into um, that portfolio of buildings so that we can, we can really affect change. Um, the environment that I work in is sometimes pretty high pressure. Um, the, the, the tall blue high rise that I mentioned to you, is uh, Mr. Obama's favorite hotel in San Francisco. We've had the honor of hosting him and his uh, 250 or 300 closest friends and military advisors uh, about six times uh, over, over the past few years. And it's always uh, you know, a bit of a challenge. Uh, I get to know the Secret Service pretty closely. and We go through the entire hotel top to bottom a few times before he arrives and then a few times while he's here. The vigilance is amazing. Um, and so it, it, you know, it makes it kind of difficult for me as an energy manager to have an effective repertoire that doesn't get somebody a little tweaked. Um, energy challenges are, in the past at least, thought to be um, uncontrollable. So in, in our industry in particular, and with this company, when I, when I first joined, 
energy management was a very foreign topic to them. And so for someone like me, it's made for fertile uh, ground. Um, I think that energy is absolutely controllable, and I spend a lot of time thinking about how I might go about that. We, we have quite a diverse and, and dynamic environment. There are things going on in different parts of the hotel all, all the time. And it's, it's pretty difficult to evaluate who's doing what, when, and where. So having real-time, immediate in, information is, is critical to effectively managing the uh, different areas. We do some sub-metering so we can keep you know, an eye on how things are evolving. But um, customers are customers, after all, and they are always right. And uh, I, I look at you know, demand charges um, much the way I looked at you know, the, the post-9-11 world when everyone was talking about you know, the terrorists only have to get it right once, we have to get it right 100% of the time. Well, I think demand charges are very, very much like that because for one 15-minute period during the month, I'm going to be punished for the entire month if I'm not careful. So, um, and over time, um, over the past 10 years, demand charges are the uh, fastest escalating, fastest growing area of uh, rate tariffs, and while, while actual consumption charges are uh, somewhat slower in their growth. In my world, in what I do, uh, since I'm a cost center in the hotel and I don't typically generate any revenue, uh, every dollar that I save immediately drops to the bottom line. So the money that I can avoid spending equals between five and seven dollars in, uh, in in revenue on the top line that the sales folks would have to find. So over over the course of our effort, and we are a legal hotel, and we also have aspirations to platinum, and we will be embarking on that over the next few months. But uh, over the the time that the hotel has been open, uh, in looking at the uh, financial statement, what we noticed for impact in that area is that last year. Our sustainability efforts, and that's not just battery storage, but all of the different methods that we use uh, to be uh, a, a green hotel, have accumulated to about 7% of total profit. So, you know, that's not a really big number, but in our case, it approaches a million dollars. And it is found money that doesn't really cost the hotel a whole lot to get. Um, oops, I went the wrong way. So here's the footprint of uh, the STEM system that uh, I'm, I'm working with. You can see uh, the three modules there that are, are packaged together are um, very small and uh, very compact. Um, one of the things that I really like about this and, and what caught my attention immediately was that over the, over the past few years, every method, whether it be load, not load cycling, load scheduling, uh, any type of load management, usually had some kind of customer impact, and it rarely was positive. So you had to find uh, just the right uh, balance of measure to get uh, the outcome without affecting the, the, uh, the guest stay. Because the last thing you want to uh, see when you come to my hotel is that uh, you know you, I ask you know three four hundred dollars a night from you, and then I take away your lights, or I take away your air conditioning, or I take away anything. You know? um, just not going to bring you back very quickly. So we found that um, this, this system allows us to manage completely transparently with absolutely no uh, uh, guest comfort impact. And, uh, uh, and beyond that, for me and my staff, it gives us information in real time that we can use to moderate our methods and measures for uh, other things that we manage, as, as well as um, just giving, giving us that insight. Um, so the software, the predictive analytics that uh, um, comes with the package, looks out 30 days in advance, and it, and it looks for an optimum point of uh, discharge for the batteries to maximize the battery life, as well as maximize the impact on uh, the bill. Um, we typically charge off-peak overnight, so the batteries are getting refreshed at, at uh, you know the least costly uh, hours of the day, and then discharged at the highest um, charges during the day. Um, we are very, very active in our partnership with, with STEM in that my team uh, uses it as an input in, in, at the moment, manual terms to our building automation strategies. So in other words, when I'm getting information from them about how expensive the electricity is or where we are on our um, 
on our grid for the day, on our uh, show of consumption for the day, we will, uh, we will trigger uh, load reduction strategies. So I have the ability to drop 100 kilowatts of load um, at any time that I, that I need to, and couple that with a 54 kilowatt system, which STEM is currently deployed on, uh, on site. So this gives me the ability right now to manage, and to put it in context, the, the typical load for the hotel is about three quarters of a megawatt. So currently, I can manipulate roughly 150 kilowatts of demand to reduce those, uh, those demand charges. Uh, over time, actually early next year, I expect to be able to deploy about 200 uh, kilowatts of battery storage, as well as um, the 100 kilowatts that I can get from uh, the rest of uh, uh, the, the the load management that I have there. So I think that's going to be an exciting story to tell. And we're also working to take the predictive analytics and input it into uh, building automation systems in both hotels, the, the Mark Hopkins as well as the um, one, at, one at Moscone Center, so that we can do some real-time um, par uh, parameter setting within the building automation. So it's, you know, typically, we've been demand response. We want to be um, demand prediction. Uh, and, and look for you know, kind of where the puck is going to be instead of where you know, it's already been. So um, last week we had uh, a pretty hot day, the hottest one so far this, uh, this year. And on my phone, we have a, we have a 700 100 kilowatt threshold to, that we use to trigger uh, our attention. So we don't watch it all the time. We have lots of other things to be doing. And so we would we get, but we get alerted every time um, our, our system hits 700 kilowatts or we think it's going to get there. And so we go into and, and, and evaluate whether or not we're going to trade the rest of the uh, load reduction. So uh, last week, it, it looked as if we um, might see a 900 kilowatt spike that, that day, which would be huge for us. I think uh, we, that would probably be precedent setting in the history of the hotel. Um, we were able to, I found out today, reviewing the stats of, at STEM before I came down, maintain that, uh, that, that peak kilowatt uh, to 805 kilowatts instead of the 900 that we could have gone to. So that's a, that's a, a very nice benefit to um, working with this, uh, this system, and that is in you know, the, the, the near real-time arena. Um, our projections overall are you know, somewhat modest, I think. We have a, we have a shared savings agreement in place with, uh, with STEM, and we do have an SGIP um, grant, so uh, not a lot of upfront costs. So we expect to save $13,340 per year based on strictly pure batteries. So relying only on the hybrid building approach of, of uh, STEM, the uh, lithium ion batteries, we expect to save 13,300. I think the, the real opportunity for me, though, is in how much leverage I can gain from the insight that I get from their, uh, their software and how much I can manipulate that extra 100 kilowatts of load. I, I truly think that maybe next year I'm going to be able to come back and report to you that we've, we've improved that by 50 or 100 percent based on our ability to control these other loads. <coughs> So we, we had uh, pilot systems in place for a year, um, or actually I guess just about two years at both hotels. And we noted uh, you know, proven savings. We had uh, our folks come in from, from Corbett. You know, if it looks too good to be true, they believe it probably is. So they wanted to make sure that you know, we, were, we were doing um, our, our due diligence. So some pretty tough um, challenges by my boss and, and them. We do have 16 other projects that are coming online over the next year and a half uh, as well. So we are also going to be playing in the aggregated demand response uh, arena with the system. Um, it's been extremely reliable, no, no issues whatsoever. Um, and over 10 years, strictly based on what we know now and based on the lithium ion battery, we expect to save uh, you know, 1.1 million. So thank you very much. If you've got a building, you've got to have one of these. All right, thank you. I'm Tom McCalmont, and let's see if this will advance here. Okay. Yep. I'm the last speaker of the day. I stand between you and your email and your cocktail hour, so I'll endeavor to be brief. Um, 
I'm going to provide a little bit of a different perspective. I'm an engineer, and we work with all kinds of partners to deliver projects. So I'm going to talk about specific projects, three specific projects that have been built and installed, and some of the experiences that we had on the permitting and interconnection side, some of the challenges that we faced. And so it's a little different in the sense that I'm going to talk about our warts and birthmarks and tattoos that often don't get discussed at a conference like this. Um, just briefly on the Calmont Engineering, my company uh, does uh, both solar and energy storage design and engineering. Uh, we work on the solar side primarily on the uh, commercial, industrial, and large utility scale uh, side. Uh, we've been in business doing that for five years, and I have eight prior years of experience in solar. Uh, the, the, the picture in the background that you see is a large truck port. Uh, those truck ports are about a quarter mile long. Um, there are four of them at Fort Hunter Liggett in uh, Cal Central California. Uh, the Army uh, parks their trucks under those during the daytime, and they generate about 75% of the power needs of that base. So that's a typical project for us. There are several other projects listed here. Uh, we are currently working on uh, an 18 megawatt solar farm for Fort Detrick, which is an Army base in Maryland and a, a large commercial plant in, on a landfill in Southern California. And we've, we've done some work on a Puerto Rico plant, and Puerto Rico is an island economy, and as you might know, the grid is pretty, uh, pretty delicate in an island economy, and so storage is a very important uh, component to add with renewables as you deploy those. So that project has both uh, renewables and, and storage. Um, we work in many different states uh, around, the, around the country, and we are ven vendor agnostic. Um, I, I'll talk in these slides about a few specific partners we've worked with. We really don't have favorites. We love all our children equally. So the first project is, um, is solar, had solar on an existing facility. This was the city hall in Benicia. Um, and adding to that um, a, an energy storage system that was primarily a reserve for a fast charging, a level three charger. And we worked with Jelly, um, who was the software developer, the integrator for this project. Uh, the batteries were from Code, that's the battery bank there and the, and the fast charger in the picture. The existing system was 175 kilowatts of solar and it had two inverters, but those inverters were located at some distance from the main meter and there was about 100 foot underground pathway to deliver that power back to the meter and that went through a paved area so it really wasn't anything that we wanted to disrupt. We wanted to leave those conductors in place. And so that presented some engineering challenges which I'll talk about. Under uh, the then current rules, this PV system was NEM interconnected, net metered, um, but with the addition of energy storage it needed to move to what's known as the NEMMT uh, multi-tariff. And that requires something called an NJOM, which is a net generation output meter, to measure the net difference between the any power coming from the energy storage system and the power that would be delivered by the solar system. And the PV system is allowed to export into the grid and get net energy credits for that. Energy storage is not permitted to export into the grid. So the utility needs a way to determine where the electrons are coming from. And so that's the purpose of the, of the NJOM. So it's basically the utility's insurance that the ES cannot be used to arbitrage power or do load shifting with battery capacity alone. And you know, those of us in, in, in my business think that's a little bit of a red herring. It, it wouldn't be really practical or economic to use the batteries for that purpose. If you did it, you would quickly exhaust the, the life of the batteries if you did that on a routine basis. But nevertheless, that's the rule. And so there has to be an end job any time you add a storage system to, to a net metered solar system. Um, the engineering challenge was that the because of the way the solar had been designed with this 100 foot run, it, it required two separate end jobs. We had to put one on each of the inverters. There was no way to really effectively combine the power and deliver it through one one uh, end job meter. So that added quite a bit of cost to the, to the uh, project. Uh, this was really an unanticipated cost because it didn't become identified until later in the process as we were uh, working with PG&E. And so it added about $10,000, both in terms of the equipment, the meter cabinets, the meters, and the interconnection fees that were required for those two meters. 
Now, last week's CPUC ruling, for those of you who follow those, um, partially reverses the MMT requirements, so it's possible that we'll get some fee rebates uh, back uh, because now that project, I think, would fall under NEM. There's a slide here we kept track of the timeline. This was eligible for the fast track process under Rule 21. Um, the initial review process by the utility took about six weeks. Um, and for those of you in the know, if, if, if a project moves, needs to move to supplemental review, that's a much longer process and requires more fees. These did not, this project did not have to go to supplemental review, so it was really the fastest process, the initial review. Um, but one of the challenges with these systems is all of them uh, are quite young in the market. And so UL listing and UL certification is something that's still getting figured out. Uh, batteries now fall under UL 1973, which is a fairly recent standard. Uh, solar inverters fall under UT, uh, UL 1741 for non-exported power, uh, which is a, a standard that's been around for a while. But the integration of those two standards really hasn't been um, well addressed yet. And UL is working on a combined standard for energy storage. I, I imagine it'll be several years before that becomes available. Next, we moved on to the self-gen review and approval process. Um, then the city sign-off and, and uh, inspection process. By the way, the red and the green here simply refer to was the time on the utility side of the meter or on the customer side of the meter. So to try to be fair to both parties, and no, no party's responsible for all the, all the time that this takes, and, and some of the delay or some of the time uh, should be allocated to both parties. Um, then we move on to the inspection uh, by the utility. Uh, they field install and inspect the NGON meters and, and basically uh, they're difficult to uh, schedule. Uh, their comment, uh, I put in quotes here, but it's basically is, it's that we, don't call us, we'll call you when we're ready to inspect. Uh, we had some added kind of confusion over the uh, connection, uh, the connection of the solar was a three-wire connection without a neutral, which is perfectly acceptable and code compliant for, for solar systems. But to install an engine meter requires a neutral connection, which means converting it to a four-wire connection. And so that created some back and forth with the utility and some delay while we worked out how to do that. Um, and then the final inspection, finally the PTO, the permission to operate letter. So the total time was about 32 weeks, uh, roughly half a year. Uh, to go through the process, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm uh, providing that merely as information. I'm not intending to be critical about the process in any way. Just information about the time that it typically takes to uh, go through the process steps of the self-gen, uh, the inspections, and the PTO. The second project is uh, one that we did in our own building, and this was a uh, commercial. ES system for shaving demand peaks, um, and, and also, frankly, for us to learn ourselves a little bit about the self-gen process. This was also self-gen eligible, um, and we have an existing solar system on our roof, and so we, again, interconnected uh, to that system, which is which is a NEM system. Uh, again, there was some confusion over the NGOM, and, and this was actually, we, we were doing this project in the, in the previous one at the same time. And, and what we discovered in the submittals uh, to PG&E were, in, in one case, the NGOM was on the solar interconnection side, and in the other, it was on the energy storage interconnection side. And it seemed uh, strange to us that PG&E had approved these meters in two different locations. And so we called up our contact at PG&E and said, why is this? Why are they different between these two systems? And the answer was, oh, let me look into that and we'll get back to you. And it turned out that it wasn't right. They were supposed to be in the same place on both projects. So we did have to move our NGOM meter, and, and we had already applied for and obtained a second permit with the city. Um, the city required an additional inspection to because uh, the system had been installed and approved. Uh, they required a second inspection to, for that second uh, go-around with the NGOM. So that caused some delays. And, and the other thing that was interesting, we, we, with this system, we made it all the way through the self-gen uh, verification. Self-gen requires an independent third party to come verify the system before uh, they'll pay the rebate. And so when the inspector came, I, I asked him, I said, so have you done a lot of these? I'm figuring that he probably had. And his comment was, this is only the third combined PV and storage system that we've seen at this stage. Now, there's hundreds in the queue. 
but very few have advanced to the stage where they're actually ready to have a rebate be paid. So that was pretty interesting, uh, a pretty interesting comment. That was just a, a couple months ago. Um, timeline in this one was, was similar. Um, again, some back and forth over the end job in the city, um, but the timeline was again about a, about a half year to do this project. And then the third system uh, is actually not a self-applicable um, project. Uh, this is actually a residential project, which we, we almost never do, but we were kind of intrigued with this one because it was, a, it was new construction, and the homeowner wanted to use the system for backup, but he wanted to deploy it in a way that it would back up his entire house in the event of an extended outage. And those of you who live in Palo Alto may remember a few years ago there was an airplane crash and the city lost power for an entire day. And so people who live in Palo Alto, I, I also live in Palo Alto, kind of remember that and kind of are cautious about, well, how do we protect ourselves if that should ever happen again? So that was the case with this homeowner. Um, and we were also, um, we, we, we were interested to work in Palo Alto. Some of you may know Palo, Palo Alto has a reputation for being very strict with their solar permitting, one of the most uh, strict in the state. And so we thought, well, what better place to work with the city and learn about the issues that we're going to face as we deploy these systems with a very, um, a very challenging uh, building jurisdiction. And anytime you connect any piece of electrical equipment to any building, your house or, or a commercial building, doesn't matter, you will need to obtain a building permit. It's simply part of the, part of the requirement to deploy the systems. So uh, again, no municipal, uh, I mean, sorry, no self-gen, it was a municipal utility, but the permit challenges were similar. Uh, we, uh, again, had a number of challenges with the, with the UL listing because the standards are not well set yet. The, um, the case here in this picture is actually a NEMA 3R, it's a rainproof enclosure, and the city required a rainproof enclosure even though this is inside a, the, a, the garage because the house was sprinkler. And so their concern was, well, what if the sprinklers go off and, in a fire, and that shorts the batteries, and that creates some kind of an issue. So, um, and so there were a lot, of, a lot of back and forth with the utility about the UL requirements of that case, the disconnect for that case, and the, and the, uh, the batteries within. Uh, another issue, the batteries were sealed lead acid in this uh, case. Uh, they, they had, uh, you know, there's no uh, liquid electrolyte in these batteries. They have uh, 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 virtually no outgassing, and yet the, the city required venting and containment uh, for the batteries. Um, so that added about two thousand dollars to the cost. So it was a complex uh, permit issuance. It took about five months, a lot of back and forth with the with the city um, to resolve all of these questions. And so, you know, kind of the key point here is a licensed engineer can be helpful to navigate the, the, uh, the codes and the understanding in obtaining these permits. So in summary, um, I've been in solar for 14 years. Uh, the industry is young. It's very much, feels very much to me like about circa 19, uh, 2003 in the solar industry. The processes are immature. There's a lot of education. Uh, we're really educating everybody, you know, ourselves, the cities, the utility, everybody's in this together, working together, trying to understand the processes and make these systems go together as, as simply as possible. And, and no, nobody's to blame. It's, it's just the nature of the industry where we are today. Um, the complexity is also very high. You know, grid-connected solar is very, very simple conceptually. You have an inverter, you have panels, you net meter it, and that's how it works. It's a very simple in operation. But as you can see in these three examples, these are three different applications that do very different things. We have demand mitigation, we have backup, we have fast charging with, with energy reserve. Um, each one has its own character, each one has its own problems. And so as we deploy this technology on a broad scale, we're gonna face a number of issues with you know, learning how to deploy it for those specific applications. So it's important to understand those processes, understand the utility, understand the self-gen, how to streamline these applications through the many steps that are required. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll sit down and we can engage in any questions.
Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, I want to move to audience questions uh, pretty quickly while you're still remembering them. Um, I do have a couple of easy questions uh, for our panelists to begin with. Um, Harry, I'm going to start with you. Uh, President Obama was here in Mountain View a couple of weeks ago uh, making a major speech uh, and, uh, and sounding pretty knowledgeable on the subject of building energy efficiency. And uh, you've been in facilities for a long time. You know a lot about this. I see you've met him. How would you rate his knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we didn't have a chance to discuss it, but uh, I, I would say that he's the, the, the most knowledgeable that we've had and probably the most knowledgeable we can expect for some time to come. So, um, you know, my, my thoughts on this are that, uh, you know, th th this is a young uh, effort, although, you know, 40 years ago we were talking about trying to get things moving in, in these directions. And even, you know, when I was at Sun Microsystems with Johnson Controls, uh, you know, we were looking at the, the rolling blackouts and, and how to move these issues forward. So my, my response is that we have no time to waste because the politics of what's going on could change at, you know, any election and uh, likely will to some degree. So I think he's our best shot in the foreseeable future. And uh, you, you've, you, you've obviously worked on a suite of uh, sustainability related improvements uh, uh, at uh, the hotels. How do you make the case to the CFO around something like storage, especially the technology being so new? Um, th there isn't a, a large volume of, of business case referrals to, to call on. How did you make that case to your finance organization that you should give this a shot? We, uh, you know, we started off uh, the first year, we, we opened the hotel in, in uh, 2008, February 28th actually, and I ran the building exactly the way it was given to me that first year, so we established a pretty strong baseline for making a case year over year. Um, Eleven months into that first year, I started uh, working with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric and many others who uh, found me quite humorous asking for a retro commissioning uh, project. And fortunately, at 11 months, we got that started. And so our year over year, after retro commissioning a brand new building in downtown San Francisco, built by very reputable people, we found a 16% savings in electricity and a 25% savings in natural gas. Uh, even at that, that young stage. So during that year, I was able to deliver that result and also um, several rebate checks for you know, the various um, lighting and other you know, um, projects that, that we did along the way. So 2009 came along and it was, a, it was a bad year in the hotel business in San Francisco. You know, 2008, we saw the economy uh, pop. And uh, so when those checks came rolling in to um, our management, actually three months out of the year, rebate checks made the difference between us reporting a, uh, a profit and a loss to our, our ownership for those, those reporting periods. So um, the, the answer is uh, I had built credibility over a fairly long period of time, uh, so it, it gave me uh, a place to stand. And, I, and I'd also lost. Uh, I worked really intensely for a couple of years with um, PG&E and, and several others trying to uh, prove a 50% reduction in that same building in uh, energy consumption was possible by moving quickly and applying aggressive uh, management strategies and eliminating waste. Uh, I'll, I'll probably never be able to get a building like this to zero net energy, but you know what I want to do is get to 100 on the energy star scale through efficiency only. Terrific. And uh, Tom, three different use cases uh, you described uh, all, all very different. There's, there's the electrical engineering aspect to this, making everything work together. Uh, there's also the, the, the value angle, and it seems like sizing is has got to be a real challenge when you look at putting a storage system together with solar uh, or integrating it with other applications. And, and again, this is relatively new. Uh, Tariffs are, are changing. You, you talked about some rules that changed literally uh, in, in the course of your project. 
how do you do the, the value engineering when you design systems? Well, you're right. The sizing is difficult. The, you know, several of the companies here that um, spoke spoke about demand reduction, which is, I think, widely recognized as sort of low-hanging fruit. It's, everybody recognizes there's value. There's a lot of work being done on the algorithms for that, demonstrating that value. I think the there's incredible value on kind of service back to the utility. And the utility would be potentially willing to pay for services in a distributed network to provide things like bar control or frequency regulation. But the policy uh, procedures and regulations for giving them the ability to pay that is, is not worked out yet. And so you, you hear a lot about that at these conferences and a lot of talk about that. The gentleman who spoke about PGM. Um, uh, I think they've been one of the most, one of the best leaders in terms of looking for potential opportunities. But the notion that the utility would pay somebody on the other side of their meter to provide a service back to them on the utility side is something that we've never dealt with before. This is the first time we've really kind of dealt with that, that value proposition. So it is hard to say. Uh, why don't we open up uh, to the to questions from the audience? Questions? Right here. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, valuable experience in uh, installation PVM ES. In uh, three cases, uh, how about the payback period in normally for the clients? Some cases are uh, with uh, SDIP, on other cases, uh, no SDIP. Yeah, I don't have any data yet because the systems are too new. I think in the first two cases with the demand reduction, the payback will be fast. It'll be a few years, but we don't have enough data yet to really that. Right here. Um, Harry, how did your interaction process work? Much the same as his. Like, actually, we, 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 uh, oh, sorry. Um, I, I, several of the same speed bumps uh, occurred along the way for us. Um, I, you know, I haven't thought through and put it in exact weeks, but um, I think we were, we were much more like. Um, I want to say 12 to 16 weeks in the process rather than you know what you experienced and but a great deal of that was built uh, I think based on the, the relationship that we'd already established um, in in the community and with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric so uh, I had my account representative uh, as my chief advocate working you know very very diligently uh, to help us get through the process so there's no question in my mind that that is a significant hurdle that we have to work out, and uh, we need to lobby hard to make sure that they, they pave the way instead of throwing up roadblocks. Could I follow up on how is that installation with the city and the uh, installer back to over time? Uh, it went extremely well. Um, I, I actually challenged the uh, installation folks to manage the process as a critical environment. And uh, so we were very, very diligent uh, from an engineering perspective in making sure that we went through uh, each task uh, and had a, you know, someone signing off on every, uh, every task along the way to do the installation uh, because we did it live. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was flawless. Um, the execution was, was very, very, very seamless. Craig. Thank you uh, for sharing both experiences, uh, both presenters sharing your uh, vast experiences. Um, it, my question is, is, is um, the, the, there's no question about the value of distributed energy storage. Um, and thinking about what JB um, from, from Tesla had to say this morning, he seemed to be indicating that the the behind the meter energy storage is kind of a, a kludge. You know, it's a way to monetize the, the energy storage right now, um, but it's it's suboptimal. And, and getting it out onto the broader grid, or at least allowing the, the energy services to be uh, flowing out and not necessarily be kept behind the meter is is kind of where the future is going. At least that's that was my interpretation of what JB had to say. Um, do either of you have thoughts on that and, and um, kind of where the future is going with, with energy storage and is it, is, it, is it bigger than just reducing demand charges and, and, and is, it, is it more about keeping 
the, the entire grid stable, the distribution grid stable? Yeah, I, I would disagree a little bit. I think there's an, an immense value in distributed resources, number one. The, the cheapest kilowatt hour is the one you didn't consume to begin with. So if you can offset a demand peak, that's, that's a huge win. Um, I, I, I grew up in the computer industry, and, and so I always draw an analogy to the computer industry, which evolved to a place where both centralized and distributed resources became valuable. We, we all carry computers in our pocket that are distributed. We have the internet, which is a centralized resource, and it's the combination of the two that, that, that really works. And I think energy is on that same path. So I, I think if there are immense opportunities to deploy energy storage everywhere in the grid, everywhere from the utility, transmission, distribution, um, you know, down at the local level for neighborhood uh, support, and at the distributed level to reduce the consumption of, of, of electrons. So I, I really think it has value everywhere. Thank you. Um, the point that you make is uh, very valid, and the reason we did not choose Tesla. <laughs> um, I, and, and seriously, I, I, I looked at their, their products and, and their approach, and, and uh, I think that the, the approach that we chose was much more valuable to me as an energy manager in a, in a building, because I want to take advantage of all of the power that comes from uh, these types of systems to help improve the overall experience uh, in, in our building and our overall cost. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a real fan of monopolistic practices. And I think it's about time the grid had some competition. And I want to see distributed energy, you know, and, and what it can do to uh, at least move the country and the thinking ahead in energy management areas. Uh, it's, in my opinion, you know, we got, what, 70, 80 years of this mishmash of poorly designed distribution grid out there, and, and we are very nearly at a, a, a breaking point, a tipping point for that. If that's what you like, keep doing what we've been doing, because that's what you're going to get. Well, we have to wait till 3.48 to get the best singer of the day. <laughs> uh, we're getting close to the end time-wise. Any, uh, any other final questions out here? Yes, right here. Uh, uh, because of the SGAP projecting, and you see you account in your you know calculations, say overall savings you you calculate this way. But uh, of course, uh, as the SGAP ends, in case if the you know it it will not be continued further, then what would you think of like you know uh, affecting your future calculations provided? No more SGAP will be accountable to your, you know, whatever calculation. I think uh, government plays a very important role in the young life of markets. I think incentive programs can can seed the market and help uh, get them established when they're young. Uh, we saw great success with that in the solar industry through the CSI program, which is now virtually ended, but managed to create an enormous growth in the solar industry in California and prices came down. It did exactly what we hoped it would do, and so I, I think the same thing will happen with storage. Thank you. All right, maybe one final question, if there's even one final question. Yes? Um, yeah, you commented about Obama. I was wondering if it's more of that his speechwriter actually knows a lot about <laughs> it. <laughs> so one what, what of the things I would like to comment on, or a question for, uh, I think, Harry, you commented about Tesla. So what can we do to really push innovation to have more startups before Tesla gets the, the big gig plans? Because my concern is, like you were commenting, the monopoly with Tesla being, if they actually develop the prices low, would it actually kill a lot of other startups? Well, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, you know, I have an intuitive sense, though, that um, we, you know, I, I'm a believer in the fact that I don't know what I don't know, and I need to learn. And in order to learn, I need to do. And so, uh, I think that you know, the, the STEM approach, the hybrid hybrid building approach, 
is a is a perfect fit for a building like mine. I have you know a variety of, of tools at my disposal. They are uh, a, a great one, and they fill a niche that's uh, unfilled by others. Um, and it's it's truly innovation, and I think it's a bridge technology that will be transformative. Um, it fits everywhere, and, uh, and and will be scalable from you know the 7-Elevens on up to you know very very large uh, buildings. And and it seems to me that you know that's probably where the greatest portion of the load is in the country that um, we can affect. And I desperately want to see us get into the built environment. You know. Um, Tesla is a big name in the world, and I my hats off to them. They're they're wonderful innovators, and Elon Musk is, you know, uh, a, a real answer to a, a problem today in, in the market. But I just don't think they're uh, thinking in the way that I would like to see the thinking uh, done for energy storage on the behind the meter side, at least. Does that answer your question? Any final? All right, well, I think with that, I would like to acknowledge and thank our great panelists here today, Harry and Tom. Thank you for taking time.